the Royal Blue Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Hello everybody and welcome to the Royal Blue Podcast. It's Wednesday, it's the preview team selector show and joining me in the Royal Blue studio to talk all things Everton, we have the Echo's Ever NFC correspondent, home and away, Joe Thomas. Joe, how are things all good? Yeah, very good, cheers. Slow during the international breaks, felt like it's been quite a slow international break for Everton as well. I mean, we're so used to kind of getting mad stuff happening off the pitch that there's never a period of calm. This has actually been quite calm. Yeah. So, on the one hand, enjoying that, but on the other hand, kind of have been a little bit almost bored, I'd say. I mean, we all miss football when yeah. it's not here, and I'm kind of looking forward to football coming back, but I actually really enjoyed this international break. Yeah. Spending time with the family, not having to worry about making sure what time Everton are on, obviously going the game, even, even looking out for other fixtures and stuff like that. So, it was nice. I think it was, although you could say it has maybe stopped our momentum a little bit, obviously with the three unbeaten games. Um, I can't, I've kind of enjoyed it, but obviously back to it on Ipswich, which you and Chris are, you know, will be travelling to Ipswich on, uh, well, Friday, won't you? And then you'll be uh, going to the game on Saturday. So uh, it's obviously all starting, starting to pick up now, all the content, all the, uh, the football talk. So, yeah. Um, today's agenda, it's not the usual team selector preview show. That is because obviously there is a little bit of uncertainty regarding injuries and fitness um, with players still retaining from the international break. So what we're going to do is we're not going to pick our team for Saturday against Ipswich just yet. Basically, Joe and I are going to pick what we believe to be Everton's best team on paper and best 11, which I think is, to be honest, Joe, at the moment is probably a bit of an arduous task. I mean, I think I, I still think that Sean Dyche is trying to work out what his best eleven is. Um, yeah. So I think if if we're trying to work it out, I think it's you know it's it's a tough gig. Um, but if you're working on the basis that everyone's fit and available, then I, I think you've got a chance of finding. I, I definitely think most of us would agree on seven or eight of them, and then it's probably a few tweaks. Yeah. Right back, centre midfield are probably the two big questions for most people, and then. Probably the debate that I imagine that we'll get into is the where do Manil and Nandai play? But, but I imagine that most of us would have them both starting as well. So You're absolutely spot on because our teams, I've seen yours, you haven't seen mine, but it's not too dissimilar. Yeah. And there is literally what you've just said there. I think it's two or three differences of positional play and um, personnel as well. So if you are watching on YouTube, you will be able to see that we use our team selector graphic for, for this. So Joe's got a nice shade of yellow for his players and I've got oh sorry Joe's got a nice shade of pink and I've got a nice shade of yellow so if you are watching on YouTube you'll be able to see with the graphics and if you're just listening then unfortunately you'll just have to to listen um we're not live <clears throat> excuse me but we are pre-recorded this is a pre-recorded show so let us know in the comments whether you agree or disagree with mine or Joe's picks for Everton's best team um, the usual plugs, please give this video a like and please give it a share and subscribe as well. All the support that you give us is greatly appreciated. I mean, Joe, before we get into picking our team and a couple of other tidbits that I want to run through, just, I mean, there's a little bit of Everton news knocking around. Um, you've been in this morning in the office writing a few things. Um, first one I'll, I'll pick up on is, it, you know, Dominic Carver lewin has been linked away with the club. What, what do we know, if anything, with regards to his links to, to Juventus? Yeah, I think just expect more of this the closer that Christmas gets. Um, I think it's fair to say that the Italian press can be quite loose when it comes to transfer rumours and things like that. There's a lot of speculation. I think that's probably, you know, I've worked for five or six transfer windows now in this job and probably one of the worst sources of information for me to get, oh, something's come up on this. is is normally the Italian press and yeah. trying to work out whether or not it's right or wrong. That's not to say that it's always wrong, but like trying to distinguish the chatter and there seems to be a lot of chatter that comes from Italy. It's very, very difficult to, you know, try to distinguish between that and the real news. Treat anything like this with a lot of caution at the moment. Dominic Alva Lewis, you see, he's a name which is going to be easy for people to discuss and have up in headlines because we know that he's a talented striker, goal scorer, um, who is obviously out of contract with Everton at the end of, of this season and therefore available on a free and could sign pre contract terms with a, a European club um, in January. So, so expect lots and lots of this. And I think a few, I've seen a few other people suggesting that. I think some of these reports suggest that they might have a battle with um, clubs in Saudi Arabia and things like yeah, that as well. Yeah. But again, no clubs mention as to who they might be. Um, but we'll just have to wait and see. I do think there will be competition for, for Calvert-Lewin's signature. 
Um, from an Everton perspective, obviously he hasn't signed the new deal. He was offered fresh terms earlier on um, in the summer. We saw how all that played out. And I think there was still a question mark around what would happen to him even going into transfer deadline day. Nothing quite worked. There were a few conversations on the side, you know, of the of the main transfer business, even through to the the final day of the window. But nothing got <laughs> done. Um, you know, Calvert Lewin has started the season crucially for Everton. He's been fit for every game, every Premier League game anyway. Scored two goals. I think he's, I think he's played all right. I think it's been a very difficult circumstances for him. Which I think those circumstances and how Everton maybe deal with them going forward in terms of how they can actually support him on the pitch might contribute to his wider thinking as to whether or not he wants to stay or go. Uh, but from an Evan perspective, I think the door is open to, to conversations and the deal in the future for Dominic Calvert-Lewin. Um, but I think and I think this is actually quite a savvy move um, in the deal for Armando Breuer. Obviously, Everton have got an option to buy. or It's a very high number at £30 million. But there is a little nudge there that says there is a striker. We know he's very talented. He is coming back to fitness, probably will be playing for Everton in the back end of November. You know, he's got just as much of a claim to be in the forward that leads Everton to the new stadium as Dominic Calvert-Lewin now has because, you know, Everton can make him a permanent sign if they want to. That competition, that challenge, it'd be interesting to see how that impacts on Dominic Calvert-Lewin once Breuer's fit. In the immediacy then, because you've already mentioned there, there's pre-contract agreement that players can sign, mm. you know, at the turn of the year when they've only got six months left. What's Everton's position, do you feel, with regards to either letting that just contract run down or selling them in, in January for probably what is now going to be a nominal fee? Obviously, you've got caveats of PSR. We know Freakin potentially could be, you know, the owner by then. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I just feel like we've got a couple of striking options available at the club. Yeah, I think the context would be important in terms of what Evans, you know, where Evans' season is going at that point. Um, look, I think Evan would always <coughs> rather get money for him than not get money for him. It certainly had with a PSR situation. Um, there would have been circumstances that still could be if the takeover wasn't to go through, where just for pure financial reasons, um, they could really do with getting some money for him. But I think by the time we get to January, you're starting to look at more token and nominal fees because he's only got six months left of his contract. And at that point, you're weighing up the which is more valuable, having him to the end of the season or having whatever fee comes in. Now, if Everton are in a position where they're struggling to stay up or you know it looks like they're in a relegation fight, I think they'd probably be foolish um, to take whatever money they can get for him as opposed to keeping hold of him and potentially having him to lead the front line. On the flip side, if he struggles and Breuer comes in and hits the ground running, then, of course, and Everton are just mid-table. looks like we're going to have a, a relatively stable and safe season and there's no threat going into the... Um, second half of the season or there doesn't appear to be then obviously it becomes a little bit more easier to then say maybe take 10 15 million pounds if someone comes in for him um but obviously they, they need someone to come in for you know to, for, to make them question it first i i think personally i'd probably be and 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 there are obviously reports from italy around one of his colleagues that's beto yeah they're probably a, i'd be a, a little bit more confident in them because you know, one of his agents has gone on the record as saying that. Obviously, agents, you know, they move between the lines and they're trying to get the best deal for them and their client and things like that. So you can't always take them at completely face value, but they have actually got a name person saying this stuff. Okay. Um, and I think we can all kind of see again with Beto, whilst he hasn't had many opportunities this season, of that Calvert-Lewin, Beto, um, Breuer, even Chimiti, um dynamic it feels like Beto might have kind of almost found himself to the bottom of that peck in order, I think, when they're all fully fit. Mm. So he's either got to get an opportunity or make an opportunity for himself to impress or, you know, I wouldn't be that surprised if everyone were willing to listen to offers, listen for offers, yeah, listen to offers for him come January if, you know, the conditions allowed it. I mean, we discussed Beto at length on Monday's Royal Blue show and a lot of differences of opinion with regards to what we should do. I mean, the biggest stumbling block inevitably now is going to be his, his wages, isn't it? Yeah, it is. To leave. Um, it, it, it is. So, and also things like PS, obviously, if Everton, you know, Everton have still, they, bear in mind, they didn't pay a penny for him for the first year of his deal. So most of the um, transfer fee is still on the, still on the books. <clears throat> so if they make a loss for that, it looks 
particularly damaging from a PSR perspective. I don't even think they're going to be okay for PSR. I well, think they were okay for PSR in the year that ended at the end of June. Obviously, we'll have to wait and see, but there is confidence there. Um, and I think their perspective is whilst they, you know, I think they'll always have to be savvy when it comes to sales. And if, if big money comes in, offers for big players, they'll have to consider them. I think from a PSR perspective, they think they're going to be fine this time around. But if you end up in a situation where, you know, better might leave and leave a negative value on the books and you're, and as a, as a corollary of that, Calvert-Lewin staying and you're not going to get any money for him, then obviously things get a little bit more complicated. So, yeah, I think, I think Beto is an, an interest one that will, I mean, there's a lot of football still left to be played before yeah. January the 1st. And, you know, whilst he hasn't had many opportunities so far this season, obviously Chimiti is still out, still out for a while. Breuer is still out and will take ages to get up to match fitness. He's still, you know, probably a month away from even being part of the conversation. Mm. Um, and Calvert-Lewin has been, you know, his, his fitness, recent fitness record has been very, very good. But obviously there is a history there. So, you know, the, he is only a dominant Calvert-Lewin injury or knock away from probably starting for Everton. So he might still get opportunities to, to make himself important to this starting line I mean, I, I hope so, because I do think there's a player in there. I, I mean, obviously, as time at Udinese, you would consider to be a success. He scored double figures in successive seasons, as far as I know. He himself, I know we don't... We're not privy to what he's thinking or like, any of the conversations that he's had, but he must be as frustrated as anyone. Yeah, he is. I mean, he's really gone. determined to, to to do well, Evan. I think he is one of a hand. He is, he is a player. I mean, I've sat down with Beto. I've spoken to him at length about um, his time, at Evan. So far, there's there's a lot of um, disappointment and frustration with with last season, um, but possibly he's, he's possibly his own harshest critic. I think in relation to that, because obviously it was a very difficult season for Evan anyway, and for a player that's coming from. You know, a foreign league trying to settle into the Premier League and a side that tends to struggle for goals. Mm. You know, the, and was playing under a huge amount of pressure for different reasons last season. It was never going to be an easy one for him. Um, but the determination and the desire and the ambition is there. Whether the talent and whether the opportunity um, arises for him to realise that or to have a real good go at that, does we'll have to wait and see. But whilst Dominic Calvert Lewin's fit. It's it's difficult to see better getting too many opportunities. Just finally on this, Danny, you know, I've signed it out. And this is no criticism of Dice, by the way. I've just suggested that I don't think Beto fits into Dice's style of play. Mm. <clears throat> is that do you agree with that or is there any other reasons why you don't think it's it's worked out for, for Beto? I mean obviously Carbot Lewin being fit and probably being better as a striker as a whole. Yeah, well, I think that's the main one, isn't he? I mean, Dominic Cavill is a proven Premier League goal scorer, and I think even when, in, in most circumstances, even when he's not scoring, <laughs> we can see the value that he adds to the team. I think that's been lost a little bit so far this season, because I think Everton really have struggled to keep the ball up top and find a support network around him that, that works. Part of me thinks that's a little bit of having Dwight McNeil centrally as opposed to on the left, and we'll come on to that later. Definitely will. Um so, you know, like we like Beto and Calvin are not the same player, but I think one of the attract one of the many attractions of Beto to Everton when they signed him um just over twelve months ago was the kind of although they're not the same player, he does have some of the same attributes. He does allow and this was useful at times when Dominic Calvin was out last season. Uh, I think Sheffield United away, I think Nottingham Forest away. Um I think um, Brentford away, all of which you know, Everton won two of them and drew another one, and they were all valuable wins, all valuable points for Everton last season. Whilst he can't do the same job that Carver Lewin can do, he can almost do close enough to it to allow Everton to carry on in playing in that same way. It doesn't mean that, say, for instance, the problem that Frank Lampard had, where his backup to Carver Lewin was Neil Mopay, and the minute Carver Lewin comes out the side, you just at a loss because there's no way you can play with Mope up top by himself in this type of Everton lineup. Um, Beto was a bit of a bridge between that, and I think that that covered up a few cracks at times last season and actually had a degree of of, of, of success. Okay, sorry, I just had to realise that me uh, me plug wasn't in me uh, me laptop there, and my laptop was about to die, so Ooh. it's probably a good job of it. Uh, I've just noticed that, but I was listening. Don't worry. Um, let's move on then. Come away from a bit of Everton news. Um, Michael Ball, obviously Echo Columnist, former Everton player, he's been speaking about the, you know, importance and the next the, the next run of games and the importance of picking up points in those games. And he's suggested in his column that he wants Dice to to get the fans back on side. I mean, I guess the only way 
<clears throat> or one of the the biggest ways of doing that is by is by winning football matches. If I can just read a, a segment from his piece, um, just to give a little bit of context, and then obviously ask you your thoughts on it. So he's just said, I think Dice needs to get the fans uh, back on side a little bit more. We understand the difficulties be difficulties he's been under, but if we don't do the business throughout the rest of October and November then the pressure is going to be on. So this is a massive period for the manager. I mean, without question, this is a massive period for the manager because everyone keeps saying it's winnable games. But is it just a case of getting the fans back on side? I mean, we know Dice doesn't really care about a popularity contest or anything like that. What do you think? I mean, I wouldn't say he doesn't care about it. Um, you know, obviously he was very popular at Burnley. Um, he had that pub named after him. It's still named after him. He likes to make reference to that. Um, and I think there's probably an extent to which, you know, he may well, you know, he is someone that gets a lot of criticism, I think. And I think that whilst some of it's justified, um, both in terms of the results, the way he sets up, and perhaps sometimes with the way in which he communicates his ideas or, or perhaps doesn't offer much of an insight into what his thought process is, all of which make it a little bit harder for him to kind of build a positive relationship with Everton fans. Mm. But I think that you know a degree of, of pragmatism is necessary, and 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 I think that we, it remains important to remember the job that he's done at this football club, um, in such incredibly difficult circumstances. And I almost could understand if 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 he to a certain amount amount wants to almost pre- protect himself within that by not putting everything out there because just look at what Everton has done to so many managers in the past and look at the difficulty of the circumstances that you know Everton is a big club and I think that it's a far bigger club than any other that he's worked for and I think I think he's had a bit of trouble adapting to that you you go from say Burnley big club historic club obviously you know absolutely a full respect <coughs> to them but I don't think your words are picked over anywhere near as much if you're the Burnley manager so yeah, if you're an Everton match I think in a, if you're the Everton manager you, you have many different outlets that are doing that picking and offering that scrutiny as well. You have the, you know, a, a more interest in the national press. You probably have um, uh, more from the local press and local media as well. And obviously you have a bigger fan base with lots more views and lots more platforms for discussion. And that's a good thing. I think that strengthens the debate around Evan. I think it makes Evan a stronger fan base and a stronger club, um, but it probably does make it harder to, to kind of please lots of people. I think that Deitch... You know, Deitch's personality is 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 a unique one, and I think that you know he doesn't need to spend time wondering about how he changes that, or whether he can you know win fans over, or whether he needs to win fans over with with you know, Everton fans are too clever to just um, you know feed on platitudes. I always remember that the, the the probably the collective groan and eye roll of everybody when um seven 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 came out with the the Allen Ball um quote when they uh were in in in, in the midst of trying to take over Everton and everyone you could just see it was just manufactured and it wasn't real and it was just come on like treat us a, with a bit more respect from that I actually think that Dyke is showing a degree of respect by not trying to just say whatever it takes to okay. to win people over but obviously the reality is that. It comes down to results. He always says that. He's always the first to, first to acknowledge it. Results haven't been particularly good this season. Performances haven't been particularly good this season. I think some of the better results, he was eager to pitch this international break as coming at a time when everyone was just starting to build momentum, free and beaten and with Leicester, Palace and Newcastle. I think it was a good time to have an international break just to try and just reset everything and get a few players back to fitness. And also just to work through a few problems that had just been persistent throughout the start of the season, including in those three games where I think that as great as it was to beat Palace, I think the first half against Palace was probably one of the worst halves of football having to play this season. And I think, you know, as brilliant a fair play and as brilliant as it was that they came out in the way that they did and came back, if it hadn't been for individual magnif- magnificence from McNeil, that could have been a very difficult second half. Uh, and I do think that with Newcastle, you know, Newcastle had a lot of chances, maybe not clear cut chances, they had a lot, but they had a lot of chances to create very good chances, which they just didn't quite take. Um, a <clears throat> bit of bad decision making around the edge of the box. Yeah, I can't help but think that, and I know if Brown Folk was playing, these chances may not have happened. But on the flip side, if, if, if Isaac or Wilson was playing, if they had a proper striker leading the line, 
I think Newcastle could well have walked away with all three points there, and all of a sudden the complexion of the table looks very, very different. Um, you know, I wrote in my, in, we were talking about Michael Ball's column, I wrote in my column at the weekend, my Royal Blue column, that, you know, six reasons to, to try and be positive, why we might, might be able to be positive about this next, you know, these next few months. Trying to have a look at that more optimistic element because I do think you can see that if you know players coming back, new players settling in, the fixtures are every game's tough, cliche, cliche, but there are a lot of games within this period that an Everton side that wants to strive for mid table security should be winning. Um, and if they and they only need to win some of them to kind of move towards that goal. Um, so I do think that there there is a real opportunity over the coming over the coming weeks. Deitch has to find a way of realising that some of that's outside of his control. Players coming back from injury and things like that. Some of it is inside his control, fixing some of the big problems that have been an issue throughout the start of the season, like trying to work out how to defend set pieces again, because they just seem to have forgotten how to do it. Mm. Trying to work out a more effective style of play, which just doesn't see the ball just kind of rebound back from Dominic Calvert-Lewin and straight at Evans' defence and midfield again. And, you know, if, they, if he can find some solutions to that and Brad Waite returning would potentially help with that, then um, you know, I think that'll take Evan a long way to kind of improve him. But you know, it's results that he needs to focus on. And if he can get results improving, then um, I've no doubt his his reputation will as well. But I think that there is only, just to finish off, I've been speaking for ages on this point, I think there also has to be an acknowledgement in fairness to Dyson. There's only so much that he can do, bearing in mind that he is out of contract at the end of the summer. And uh, so at the end of the season, there is new ownership coming in. It's clearly a point that's up for discussion. And as uncomfortable or as frustrating as that conversation might be to anybody internally within the club, it's just a natural one that's going to continue to rumble on until that thing, until that position is solved. So effectively, they're just going to have to deal with it. <laughs> you know, so... I mean... <clears throat> bearing in mind everything you just said there, and bearing in mind what Michael has said in his column, and you know the, specifically the segment that I've I've read out with getting the fans back on side, this is more of a broader question, really. Do I don't know whether it's necessarily Everton fans or football fans in general, but we'll focus on Everton fans. Do Everton fans need a connection with the manager? Because you said there, and I completely agree, it doesn't really matter. It's all about results. But I think we've had this conversation over the past couple of weeks where, well, connection is bred from winning results. So it comes hand in hand. I get I get it all. But I mean, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here, but I don't know whether a lot of the fans, and this is how I've perceived it, so I'm not speaking for anyone else, but have really taken too much to dice. So has there got to be that connection with the manager as well? Yeah, I do think, uh, I do think a connection matters. And, and it's not that I don't think that you know, it, it matters what what Deitch says. It's just that I think it has to be acknowledged that there's, no matter what he says, there's a limit to how far that can go if he's not also getting results on the pitch. Yeah. Um, you know, we saw that with Lampard. Lampard was, I thought, was very good yeah. at creating. It felt like the great success, and obviously it's far harder to talk about this now because um, we saw how it all ended, but it felt like the great success of Lampard's reign was to re- reconnect the club and the fan base during, obviously we know what happened later on in, in the final months of his time at the time at Everton and, and how that was was completely destroyed. But during that kind of relegation battle that ended in Palace, it felt like he managed to reforge the links between the dressing room and the stands. And we saw that with the player welcomes um we saw that with you know remember the coach departing for Leicester and you got Lampard but we had a window wound down in the front and the fans yeah, yeah, waiting yeah. for him and they go off and they get that big win and things like that and, and, and I think that whilst I think it's easy to look back at the celebrations that met the win over Crystal Palace and say you know it was wrong to celebrate that moment because it was ever at their lowest ebb I do think that some of the celebration was the fact that it felt to a certain extent like there was a degree of unity, like almost like the fans had a little bit of their club back. Obviously, that um, was was you know, that was ruined. You know, what eight months or so later by you know, the actions of well, you know, yeah, that is another podcast at another time. That isn't, but um, yes, you know, it wasn't the supporters' fault. And um, 
you know, and it all ended in misery for Lampard. But I do think that when Everton are at their strongest, there there is um yeah, there there is a passion and a link between Finch Farm and um and the stands. And I think them having the manager there helps. And I think that's something that we see now. We see it with the love for Seamus Coleman. From a from the dressing room to the stands, he's that bridge. Uh, when you have a manager that's in the dugout that also that I think you have to have a manager that that respects Everton as an institution, has reverence for its history. I think Deitch does have respect for Everton and reverence for its history. Um, I think that in terms of the relationship, a lot of it is is, is circumstantial in the fact that the challenges that he's <laughs> faced and the challenges that the fan base and the club have faced over this time, there's only ever so much success that you can kind of have in building positive relationships because so much of the past few years and probably this season as well is just a really grueling fight for survival where you don't take any enjoyment from it. You're just trying to cling on until you get to hopefully the new stadium, the end of some PSR issues, some new owners. And it's then that you can kind of like build on that and actually have like positivity as opposed to just survival. You know, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that Everton fans or broad sections of Everton's fan base will ever come to love Deitch but I'm not sure it's necessarily possible for that bond to have been forged in the circumstances that we have. Yeah. And I do, and what I do think is at the very least, there might be a degree to which Everton fans come to love what Dyche did at Everton. When we look back on hope, you know, hopefully in a couple of years time, you know, we're sitting there in that new stadium coming off the back of an international break where players are coming back from all over the world because it's a side that's filled with international players who are representing their countries on the highest stages and we're going back into games thinking how could Everton push into or consolidate and stay in the European places and going into games thinking this isn't a must win because we want to avoid a relegation battle. It's a must win because we want to get you know top six rather than top 10 or something like that. Um, and I think if Everton get there, and I think it's a possibility if the right decisions are made, then they will only ever be able to have got there because of the hard work in really difficult circumstances that's been done over the past few years by people like Deitch, whether he not he gets a chance to realise the the fruit of his work is another matter. You know, um, like we said already, his contract's up at the end of this season and you know, he'd like to stay, but whether he'll get an opportunity, we'll have to wait and see. Um, but I do think he deserves a, you know, a degree of respect for what he's done, as hard as it's been for everyone. I think the degree... There needs to be an acknowledgement that some of the difficulties in, say, the relationship and, and also the product that we're watching on the pitch don't all stem from Dyke. They stem from the conditions in which he's been forced to operate in. I think give it another eight to ten months and if Everton have survived this season and have gone into Bromley more, say, for instance, you know, just speculating that Dyke has gone for whatever his contract hasn't been renewed, it'd be a fascinating show fascinating podcast to debate whether Dice has been a success or not because you'll get well I, well I mean it will be a fascinating debate from a kind of like emotional relationship from an emotional perspective but if everyone were to be in that situation I mean I can imagine I'll be sitting here saying that Dice's rule has been a success because you have got Everton there yeah I don't that's what um, I think that's exactly exactly what I mean I mean I think just final points from that on me is from the connection wise I think a connection, yes, I do think you do need a connection. I think it, it only mm. gets you so far. And I think results, the connection is bred from results inevitably. You get the obvious, you know, the the ones where, say, David Moyes comes in and he calls the club the people's club, immediately there's a connection there. I think there was certainly a connection with Roberto Martinez. Obviously, results dipped and waned. And then you talked about Lampard, exactly mm. the same thing. I thought what what you said with regards to how respectful he was to Everton and how, new, how he knew how big the club he it was, um, you know, that sort of thing. But again, results just mm. dipped. And this is why, you know, these successful managers who have a bit of longevity with clubs, that's why they have these connections with these teams because at the end of the day, they know how to win football matches. Um, okay, moving on then. We won't necessarily preview Ipswich too much because we'll probably do that on Friday before you and Chris head off. Um but we'll talk about just the next run of fixtures, mm. I guess. So we're obviously unbeaten in three, but then we've got Ipswich away, Fulham at home, Southampton away, West Ham away, Brentford at home. It's I know it's it's a difficult question to ask show, but I taking Brentford out of that, so including the Newcastle game, I said eleven points 
from Newcastle to, to West Ham. Mm-hmm. You know, that that is an actual, when you think about it, that's a a good period of games going unbeaten. That's probably something that Everton haven't done in a while. I know you or Gav might know the, the staff for that. I don't know. But what would you expect, certainly, from the, the next five it's going to be a really interesting. It's going to be fascinating. Obviously, eleven points from them. What would it be? Five games. Yeah. So I, mean, I, that's, I mean, that that's form that would take Everton comfortably into mid table. Is yes. I don't think they need eleven points to kind of necessarily pull away from a relegation battle or things like that. But I think almost the, these these next three, I think in particular, are important. Obviously, Ipswich and Southampton both about winning the Premier League this season, and Fulham, who to some extent are Deitch's kryptonite. I think at Everton, like yeah. they just re- especially at Goodison. I think, he's, I think Silver's brought him to Goodison three times against Deitch and they've won every time if you include the Carabao Cup on penalties. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I, like it, Ipswich is going to be a fascinating one. Obviously, the dynamic of international duty and things like that and Evans' injury situation. Will Brantway be fit? Will he not? Mikolenko, will he, will he not? Um, and die, will he, will he not? You know, it's it, it, it does make it interesting. Ipswich haven't had a bad start to the season really they're beneath Evan they haven't got a win but you know they've they've got four draws from their seven games with the three that they've lost two of them against been against City and Liverpool so I mean you know you can kind of I don't think you can read too much into the table there but like I think Evan Evan could really do with avoiding defeat down at Ipswich I think that coming off the back of because it's been a difficult start to the season. You know, they, they got the win over Palace. They needed it. There are positives you can take from the points at Leicester and Newcastle. But even with them, it's been a tough start to the season. I think this is the start where you need to push on from that foundation. Because I kind of think that of the clubs beneath Everton, well, two of them are Southampton and Ipswich. So if you don't take points off them, they're going to leapfrog you or come close. And then the two of the others are what Palace and Wolves, who both look a bit of a mess so far this season. But it kind of feels like both might just sort themselves out. You know, as they hits form, where well, he's been in good form anyway. But as they water the Mateta hit form for three weeks, and all of a sudden they got seven points. You know, same with Wolves, players like Cunha and that come to Wang, come to the fore, and you could maybe see it for them. So Everton need to protect themselves against that. It'd be a really good statement to go down to Ipswich and win. I think. Um, looking at the start of the season, as bad as Evans been, I do feel like there's potential. I feel like there's a gulf to Southampton, even though Southampton obviously came up and you know won on penalties in the Carabao Cup. Um, and I think they really need to make sh- that. Ha- I would really like to see them win at Southampton just to kind of just emphasize that gulf. Um, yeah, and I think they're a better side than Leicester, and hopefully better than Ipswich as well. Like it does, you look at the the, the table, and you do think there might be three teams that are worse from Everton. Well, now's the time to kind of make that clear and get ahead of them now, rather than having to do that later on this season, because um, you know it will be tough. And December gets very, very tough from a fixtureless point of view. So, so some of whatever I need to do is almost build a bit of a buffer for what might be a difficult Christmas period where Everton face City, they face Arsenal, they face Liverpool. Um, I think you know, they face you know, Man United here and there beating Evan. They, they can turn up. So, um, yeah, and then they go away to Bournemouth for the first game in, in, in January. And I know Christmas is a long way away, but December isn't that far away. Um, and these are the games that take Evan into them. So Ipswich and Southampton, they've got to be looking at getting good results from them. And I think Fulham and Brentford, they, you know, of those four games, you take West Ham out of it, you know, I, I probably do with at least eight points from them I think really to kind of give us all the reassurance that they're a stable safe side you know you know, two wins and two draws doesn't feel like a, a huge ask for a side that wants to finish in mid-table from them obviously we hope it would be better Fulham had a very good start to the season yeah. Brentford can be very good like Thomas Frank a lot um, <coughs> so yeah but that, that Southampton one I mean, Ipswich is going to be a tough place to go. I think you know, a lot of emotion there. It's obviously for, you know, first season back in the Premier League. Um, but that's Southampton one. Evan went there and won down there a couple of years ago under Lampard. Dwight McNeil scored a really good goal in that game. Um, that's one not not to fear in particular. I, I feel like the Brentford home game, the Southampton away game, those are the two where you go in. Come on, lads! Like show us you've got a little bit about you here. Um, and then the Fulham home game and the Ipswich one certainly just don't lose them because we don't want to be in this I know there's, a, there's another international break that comes up in the middle of November doesn't it and it won't be far off and we're, 
the last thing we want to do is end up in there we're in a situation and they're in the bottom three or close to the bottom three and they're heading into that tough run of fixtures in December I think the 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 phrase or the word sorry that you used buffer is so important because I think everyone's just thinking the reason these next run of fixtures are so important is because of what comes mm. comes after now we know it doesn't always work out like this we think well <clears throat> I think is it Wolves United and then I think we've got Liverpool and Chelsea, Arsenal, City are all in in yeah. and around there. You know, immediately in your own head when you pre- predict the games, you just think, right, well, we'll get, write them off because we're going to lose. It doesn't always work out like that. So I think, you know, if we've, if we've got the, the minimum amount of points following these next five and then we go into that, obviously it is going to be, it is quite scary. So I think it is important at least. I think, well, yeah, I think one of the really interesting things at the December schedule as well <laughs> is you know, we're, we're speaking at 20 past two on, on, on Tuesday. I think this podcast is going out on the Wednesday, isn't yeah. it? So we'll... Well, we'll get the, the we'll get the fixtures an hour or two after we've finished me and you. So people who are listening to this will know the TV ones. The yeah, the time and dates of the final ever Goodison Merseyside League derby, oh. um, as well as the, the Christmas schedule, which is which is going to be fascinating. And I think that will have an impact as well. We which of these games you're playing under the lights, which not what really kickoffs, what not things like that. Yeah, that will have an impact as well, held both on Everton and on on their opposition. So, yeah, I, I mean. You know, I, I, I know a lot of people will be listening to this and going of those five games, we are Everton Football Club, all five of those are winnable. And, and I agree, and obviously that's something that we, we all want to get to. But I think that if we have that attitude going into these five games, we're setting ourselves up to a bit of failure. And yeah. I think that I think that a lot of this season is just about trying to avoid getting trapped in another cycle of misery and despair like we've had for each of the last few seasons as brutal as they've been um you know we all need to have sight on what's there at the end of the season and try and get through to that um and just accept there's probably going to be an ebb and flow of fortunes until then but obviously if if Everton gets through that period and gets the next international break and the results haven't been very good well as I say whether we like it or not whether the club likes it or not there will be questions about Daichi, even if Evan thinks, well, he's the best person. To, you know, it makes no sense to get rid of him now for financial reasons or you know, just for consistency to the end of the season. Like, you know, if they go and lose three and draw one of those games, then it becomes very difficult to not have that conversation. The pressure will mount and same with players and style of play and things like that. So, you know, I mean, one thing that we'll hopefully get in December would be, you know, the take over being signed off which yeah. would inject a little bit of positivity and if that was to happen then there's a chance that you know January might yield a little bit of business if things were really bad and you know the freakins would want to protect their asset one thing they wouldn't want to do is is is, is see you know risk of falling into the championship so there's there, there are a kind of they're almost emergency levers that might be available to Everton at various points this season should the takeover get signed off that there weren't last season um but we'll have to kind of just just wait and see. Well, I mean, what would what, what, what do you, when you look, because obviously, you know, like I'm kind of looking at this more from a journalist point of view, you as a season ticket holder that's, you know, I could, I like, I know you're sitting there thinking you want 15 points and then five games. No, no, I think I'm being, I'm being quite realistic mm-hmm. with, with 11. I know we've, we've got. Like what, like what would it take for you? Like how bad would it have to be for you to go, you know what, this is like, like I'm, you know, I'm pulling the air out. Yeah. yeah, this is like even in the context of knowing that this season might just be about getting through to, you know, brighter pastures in the future, etc. What what would make you really start to get? Nervous? You mean in terms of Daisha's position? Not necessarily Daisha's position. I mean more in terms of Everton's position, you know, and and fight for survival and things I, like that. Honestly, I don't really think you start getting to that point until after yeah. after Christmas. I think. It could get quite scary if we're obviously rooted to the bottom and teams are starting to, mm. to pull away, which I did think we were a little bit in danger of before Palace. We got the win and then we've, you know, managed to consolidate with the draw against Newcastle. So I think that is a positive and I think that's this is why these next run of fixtures are so important. I think the the last thing that we, we want or need to happen is for Dice to not just Dice, sorry, just you know, focusing on him, the, the team to have a poor run of games. Mm. Certainly over the next, say, like five to six weeks, and then we pull the, the plug 
on dice say for instance and then he, we give a new manager that like horrendous run of games <laughs> like that's just the worst yeah. it's the worst option for me um i mean it, it could have the an adverse effect um, sorry it could have the opposite effect you know it could galvanize the team you know a new manager bounce we've all seen it for me i've said it countless times as much as i've been critical of the team and dice i don't want everton to sack dice i want dice to see the season through and for Freakin to come in, I don't want Freakin to make a decision. I just want him to to be able to results to be steady because I don't think let's be let's be honest. I don't think we're going to get anything higher than mid table. Although I did at the start of the season predict twelfth. So let's see the season out. Easier said than done, I know. And and let Freakin when he comes in, yeah. um, plan for for the summer. And if he if he thinks Dice is is the one to take us forward, don't necessarily agree with that, but. At least he's he's got a plan. Yeah, there, there is absolutely no appetite in that football club to sack Sean Dyche. No, uh, right yeah, now, yeah, yeah. There, there, there there is none whatsoever, and it would take a huge amount to change. I think for that to be the case, um, and I think we can all kind of understand why that would be the case, even from the Freakins' point of view. You know, again, it's even from a financial point of view, yeah, you, you'd be shelling out a package that you don't need to sell out if you think that he's not the right man to take him forward in the summer. <clears throat> you know, so so there, like, there's no desire for that, and I think it would have to. It would have to get really, really bad. Like, I don't think there's really a threat of, of, of Deitch being actually under pressure internally. What I think would make everybody's life easier is if the results are good enough to make sure that that doesn't become a conversation that gets more and more and more pertinent because the results are getting worse. And, yeah, you know, like I found, like there were there were times that I found this, particularly, you know, the, the middle part of last season where it's almost like, there are only so many times you can say perspective is more important than what you're seeing. Yeah, the long term is more important. Like every, I think every Evan fan would would realize and acknowledge that there are bigger things at play and issues, and you're know, trying to get to 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 Bramley more and things like that. But obviously, yeah, there are only so many defeats or failures that you can sit through before you go. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but. I think that hopefully Evan just get nowhere near that point of view. <laughs> like hopefully Evan get nowhere near that this season, because otherwise it's just going to be another, yeah, you know, really difficult one. And like just who just let's you know, let's just pick up points here and there. You know, be stable, be cons- you know, be consistent, be hard to beat. Get the odd win at home, get the odd win away. Carry you know, get safe into mid table, get a takeover signed off. Go through January where the business is favourable for Everton and just start that countdown and enjoy the final months of Goodison and get excited for the first few months of having more. Let's just do that. Come on, because surely this fan base deserves that after everything it's been through. We're not even asking for a trophy, We're not even asking for an FA Cup here, are we? Or a you know a, a late surge for the Europa Conference League or something like that. Just. Just, just, just give us some some nights that we can have some sleep in. No, I think I think that's right, and you know we'll we'll move on from this now. But I, I think you never until you're safe. Yeah, you're I mean, never yeah, truly. Yeah. And, and 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 again and again, like just look how bad it's been over. Like no, this, that, that's the point. This is a club you, you've just not been able to take anything for granted for for so long. I mean, without going too much into the maths of things, because we're never going to know how many points teams are going to finish on. But the, the season finishes in May. Like realistically. Based on what you've just said there about being steady and mm. picking up points, we're probably going to maybe lose more than we would win. But when when do Everton become safe on f- from that point of view? You're looking at probably still the end of March. It's April. really fascinating one, isn't it? Because it's, it's like really Everton, because last season, even with the deductions, Everton essentially became safe by December, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, which like, is crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they, went, they went five months, well, four months, didn't they, without a win in the Premier League and still kind of would still hovering above that yeah it's, it's, it's crazy there's there's certainly like there there is certainly no way ever it can can bank on the idea that there'll be three clubs that are as far below the standard of the league of the rest of the league as they were last season it may end up proving to be the case but you know like i, I don't think that is going to be the case this season like southampton look like they could struggle ipswich and leicester you know, have had good moments and bad moments this season, but they look like they can get results, don't they? And I say Wolves and um, Palace have been bad, but again, 
you look at what they achieved last season and you, you kind of, again, maybe this is just like the Everton that's gotten into me during the course of this job, like you kind of assume that they'll sort themselves out. So, Well, when did we confirm our status last season? Was it after Brentford? After it was that Brentford, win? yeah. So when, that was, was April, like, wasn't it? That, yeah, that was, that was the end of <clears> April. I mean, it was... I mean, the win over Forest was a huge step. Yeah. The win over Liverpool pretty Both. much took it. And then the Brentford one, I think, confirmed it. Because I remember my match report being the next game was losing away on the Friday night and it was, look at the Premier League and the Sky wanted to point and laugh at Liverpool, uh, point and laugh at Everton on, um, whatchamacallit, on TV, on Sky on a Friday night as they against battled Luton. out against Luton. Um, and Everton have had the last laugh because his game is meaningless to him now. Um, but I think I mean point is that um, even without, say we didn't get the point deduction, we would have finished 12th, wouldn't mm. we? So even with that respectable 12th position, as you, you would probably suggest that would, is considered on our last couple of league positions, we still weren't safe until the end or the, the mid or the end of April. Was that, that is that what when we played Brentford? Yeah, obviously with the points. Yeah, so like with that's what I'm sections. saying. Like, I you don't really start getting um, a little bit too nervous mm-hmm. until after Christmas and then starts February. You know what, what's going on here? Is are we getting things right? Is Dice getting things right on the pitch? So, you know, you could you could have a good season. You could be tenth and you could still be in a relegation battle because it, it just depends on the points. We will see. Now, should we pick our team? Not pick our team. Should we pick our best Everton eleven? How we how we see it. Um. Preamble's been a long one, hasn't it, for, for people that were tuning in for this element of the podcast? It, it was, yeah, <laughs> to be fair, but we, we give good content. I think we give good content. Let's move over to the, the team selection graphic, and I'll just move my uh, laptop around so Joe can see it. Um, so, like I said at the start, I think we couldn't really give a, a definitive what should our 11 be for Pritch because players are coming back from international duty, and it's easy to just say what mm. we think Branthwaite should be in. We don't know if he's definitely going to be fit, etc. So I think Dice has struggled to put out his best eleven this season. Um, so we're gonna we're basically gonna pick it for him. And I know it's ours, um, as mentioned, ours is um, different, which is good. So we can have a debate. So do you want to run through your starting eleven from uh, goalkeeper to strikers um, or striker, and then just with a little brief reason why, I suppose. Yeah, so obviously Pickford, Mikolenko, Branthwaite and um, Tarkovsky each pick themselves, I think, across that back five, don't they? You know, if, ever, if everyone's fit, I think... Have I you said the right back? Did you say the right back? Oh, no, I haven't got that Oh, I'm yet. sorry, you because, went there quick. Go on. Because, because that's where the, the, that's the dispute that I'm coming to. Oh, go on. Um, so if we're looking... I, I kind of struggle to work out how to approach this because I think... If you were just naming the best 11 for a one-off 90-minute game and you needed just a 90-minute performance out of them, I think the best right back pound for pound at the club probably remains Seamus Coleman. If you were looking for the best right back for you want a solid team that's you know, relatively stable for the rest of the season, then I'd probably go for James Garner. I think he can do a job there. And you know, we know the fitness issues that Patterson and... Um, Coleman have faced so if if you wanted to kind of bank on almost permanency rather than ability um, then I'd have had James Garner there for me if everyone's fully fit I would want Nathan Patterson starting at the moment and that's a kind of like I'm not I can be swayed on this but my logic for wanting him to start is essentially that right back's a big area for Everton at the minute it's one of the, the huge question marks Nathan Patterson, um, he, he has had good spells when he's been fit, but he's obviously also had a lot of injuries. I think he's one of the I think he's one of the questions Evan need to solve by the end of the season. Is he can he be the long term successor to Seamus Coleman? He has shown in in fits and starts he might have the talent to do so, but obviously you know he still has to develop and he also has to find the fitness to be able to do that. We're not going to know the answer unless unless he plays. I think he gives a little bit more going forward. Um, and I just say, I, I just... If Everton could find a player in Patterson, it's one fewer problem to solve in the summer. And they have a lot of issues to solve in the summer. There's potential for huge turnover. If the answer already lies within the squad, then let's find it now. And the only way they're going to find it is by playing him when he's fit. Dyche has shown a reluctance to do that. 
Um, but I would that would be my kind of selection at the moment. Have him in there, a bit more ambitious going forward. That does influence my position, my, my selection around him to a certain extent, as we'll see in a minute. Um, but that's it. Try and try and find. Let's not get left wandering because, as I say, whether you yeah, Coleman and Ashley Young are both out of contract at the end of the season, as it stands. Um, you know, Garner would always rather play in centre midfield. Um, and again, there's a huge, you know, huge, huge turnover in centre midfield at the end of the season. So you'd think that it makes sense to get him back there. Um, and in that conversation, try for Nathan Patterson, see if he can stay fit, see if he can impress and and then make a decision on him. All valid reasons. Midfield? Midfield. So I'll start in the middle. Um, I think Idrissa Gay remains Everton's probably best defensive, aggressive player. Um, you know, he's obviously the most experienced in that role. He is getting on in terms of years again, out of contract at the end of the season. I think his experience is key, but he's just the most combative of, of, of those midfielders. I think he's the most effective at it, you know, interceptions, getting in between the lines, putting a tackle in every now and then, just reading the game. I mean, I'd be far more emphatic if he'd put it away against um, Newcastle. <laughs> He had that no, big chance, but, yeah. he, but he's not in it for that. And <laughs> as we've debated, that may well have ended up getting pulled back for the apparent, the alleged uh, yeah. foul by Calvert Lewin on Burn. But I'd have Idrissa Gay in there, and I'd have him alongside Oral Mangala. Um, Are you I, happy with the positions left and right? Yeah, um, I, I, I've liked parts of Mangala's time at Everton so far. There have been times when I think the midfield's been overrun, but I think it might have been more set up rather than individuals. Um, you know, he retains possession quite well. He's quite good at just picking up that ball and just making sure it gets out to a fullback or pushing it out wide to one of the wide players to to run it. And I think that's a good thing. It helps Evan. It gives Evan a chance to build their way up the pitch if they've got the right people in the right places in front of him. Uh, obviously, he has the international experience as well. Um, I think the Mangala and Decore have, have shown a development of quite a nice little partnership there between them. Um but I would still have Gay over the Corey for the time being, and 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 I, I think that's just a better use of, of Evans' players, and 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 I would have these in the in these in these in these positions with the knowledge that you've got the Corey and James Garner on the bench, you can maybe come in and offer fresh legs in these positions later on in the game. Um, you know, Everton don't have the deepest squad, but it makes sense to take advantage of that where they do have a little bit of cover, and this is one of them. So you can play Mangala for 60 minutes and then bring Garner on or Decorey on, depending on what the situation of the game is. Okay. Wingers? Then wingers. Um, so in, in this case, I've got Jack Harrison on the right. I think he's an intelligent player. Um, you know, he has more experience in the Premier League than Lindstrom. Part of me has got him there because I've got Nathan Patterson behind him. So one his work rate means that he'll probably offer a little bit more cover for Nathan Patterson, who gets a little forward a little bit more than, than perhaps any of the other options at right back. Um, but I'm also hoping that in overlapping that Patterson might then create a little bit more space for for Harrison to operate in, a little bit more freedom, a little bit more space around him so he can maybe pick a pass a little bit better. Because I do think he's a player... I do think he's one of the more intelligent players within the Everton lineup, and if you give him the opportunities to find passes, he might do it. But yeah, you know, the setup doesn't really help him the way in which Everton play at the minute. But hopefully, having someone bombing on overlapping him, which say Ben Godfrey wasn't doing last season, um, that might create a little bit more space for him to find the feet of you know and die Calvert Lewin or you know teeing up passing on the overlap and help Everton get forward. That way, you can pick the ball up off. Um, off, off Mangala and just help Evan get forward without having to go aerial um, on the left and I'd go for McNeil um, and in the middle I'd go for Indai uh, which again that's probably one of the other sticking points as to you know, where we might have a bit of a dispute um, look McNeil's had some fantastic moments this season individually he's been very good but I think that to a certain extent him in the middle comes at the detriment to the team um, I think the turnover of possession becomes much higher. I think he's finding it hard to support Dominic Calvert-Lewin. I think one of the, the features of this season so far has been the difficulty of having holding the ball up. And I think a lot of that is because you're playing balls up with up the top of the pitch and you're asking McNeil to play with his back to goal. And I think that the fact that he's as one-footed as he is is a little bit more prohibitive to that. It cuts off half the pitch from where he can go to. He spends a bit of time trying to get it onto his left foot and find a suitable ball. And in that, we're seeing him being eaten up a little bit. Um, 
So I'd have him back on the left where he can still use his absolute wand of a left foot. I'm more than happy to have him cutting inside and he can interchange with and die if he wants to. Um, but really, it's a case of having that work rate to help out Mikolenko on the left as well. Um, if you've got that, if you take out and die, if you've got that eight, I think it kind of gives you the freedom to then allow um, and die to play that central role. You lose the defensive side, although he's a hard worker that, say, perhaps someone like Decorey in that role brings. But what you do have is you have a, a tricky little player who's going to cause you know, defensive midfielders and centre-backs all sorts of problems. He's going to get the ball with his back to goal. He can go both ways. He can find a pass. He can beat a player. Um, and I think that's I think that's crucial to Everton becoming a team that can be you know more effective at getting up off the pitch. Because at the minute, and this is where it helps Dwight McNeil, is Everton are essentially a very chaotic team when it comes to attacking. And because they draw teams onto them and they're happy to sit... And, and let that happen, it, you know, and then they almost break with aggression and speed, don't they? It means that whenever Manil's getting the ball and facing facing the opposition goal, they, yeah, there is a bit of space for him to wind up his left foot. Um, but I don't think, and, and the, there is no one in that Everton side that you want with the ball at their feet and a little bit of space 25 yards out from goal and central. Of course, you know, that's where you want Manil. Um, but I think it doesn't happen enough for the team's perspective, I think, over the course of 90 minutes. So I think they ever need to concentrate on becoming a side that can move up the pitch a little bit more effectively and with a little bit more considered nature and more intelligence than they perhaps are at the minute. Otherwise, everyone gets pulled out of place. And we've seen how in the first half against Crystal Palace, that becomes very difficult all of a sudden that, you know, again, that was when McNeil was playing centrally, didn't quite know what to do. So then you're in a situation where... Mangala and, and Decorey in that case kind of got pulled all over the place by Eze and Water. No one knew, we, no one knew where to go, like who, whether to go, whether to stick, etc. And it just became a lot easier to play through Everton in that first half. Um, and then you know Calvert Lewin um, up, up up top by him, by himself. Um, so yeah, that's 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 where I'm that's where I'm going. I think uh, I think Ian. I think. That is not too far from Everton's uh, best best team on paper, most certainly. And mine is not too dissimilar, so I'll quickly go through mine. In goal, Jordan Pickford, clearly still Everton's number one. On the left, Vitaly Mikhalenko, Jared Branthwaite, James Tarkovsky. And my next one is different to Joe, and it is purely down to the reason that out of all the available right-backs that we've got available, I still think Seamus Coleman is the best right back yep. at the club. Um I am totally on board with what you're saying with regards to Nathan Patterson. We know that Seamus Coleman is not going to be able to play every single game. Patterson hopefully now has his injury problems behind him, just gonna have to work on his fitness and his match fitness. If if he can get back in that team, I think my mind will change mm. over the course of the season. But for now, if Taish had his entire squad available to him for, you know, obviously Ipswich say it would be Cole and Coleman in for me just just at this moment in time. I think the midfield, it's funny that a lot of the focus with regards to Everton's problems has been on the defence. Mm. And rightly so because we've conceded so many goals and the issues that we've had with set pieces. But I also think that a lot of people are overlooking how poor the midfield has been. And you've brought it up there, how we can't keep hold of the ball and how McNeil... Yet, for all of his positives, you know, he gave the ball away so many times against um, Palace in the first half. All that is, you know, contributes to why that we are conceding goals because we're just we're just inviting pressure on. But having thought about it, um, prior to us coming in to do this show, I completely agree that Adrissa guy's got to come back in the yeah. team. Um, he, although he's not like a. The most effective ball player midfielder. He, he can he can play on the ball and he can pick out a pass. He obviously he is that player to to stop the the opposition midfield runners and put tackles in and get his foot in and and blocks etc. Et and I think I've you know I've spoken glowingly mm. about Oral Mangala over the past couple of weeks. I was quite surprised actually that he came off against um, Newcastle when he did because I thought he was he was still having a good game. Um, but for me. He has cemented himself in that that midfield now, and I just that that midfield needs to be it. It, it can't just be um, you know a blocker for yeah. the defense. We've got to get players on the ball. We've got to start winning a bit more possession back to you know alleviate the pressure 
because at the end of the day, like if you if you look at like the Southampton game, and I'm just referring to one 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 game here, but I think we lose the possession virtually every single game, don't mm-hmm. we? And it's 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 a huge frustration, and we need. I think Mangala can be that ball player midfielder. I don't think Decore is. No. Um, I think James Garner could be. I think Tim Boomin could be, but I, I also think that he, you know, has got a lot of work to do with regards to his defensive game as well. Yeah, like I'm a little bit surprised with the way in which he's been used almost in one of these defensive twos whenever he comes in. Like that, I just tend to brought him on and then say push Decore further up the pitch when really at a, at a, the, the opposite way around. I think Robin is someone that's probably better off sitting in front of that defensive two and. You know, you know he he's got a lot of words to do on his defensive stuff, but when there is a loose ball to to pick up, like he can carry it forward and he can yeah. present a an attacking threat and he at least get Evan up the pitch. And I think that's where you want him playing with a little bit of freedom, so that you know if he does misplace a pass or if he doesn't you know cut out a ball through, he's got protection behind him. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, well we're obviously going to disagree on Dwight McNeil. <laughs> uh, Dwight for me is in the middle, and it just goes to for me where where again it goes back to where he's most effective. I think either or really, I, I do I do agree with you to an extent that I wouldn't mind to see um, him and and I you know swapping and changing. I think we've seen that a couple of times over the past couple of weeks. But for me, I think when he's when he's on the left hand side, he, he just always drifts in the middle anyway. Whereas now that we've got, obviously, I'm going to show you the Illumin and I on the left. At least he sticks to, you know, mm. sticks to the line, and he he gives us that option to to get further down the wing, but also to cut inside as well. And I just don't think Dwight McNeil, um, as as a winger on that left hand side, does that. And I think Dwight as the number ten for. I don't think he's a long-term solution, mm. but I think certainly while we've got the this group of players that we've got, I think he he is the should should carry on as the number ten, and you know if he can get the space in front of him, as you've you've mentioned there, as he's already proved over the the past couple of weeks, he can score a couple of screamers. I was torn on this one, mm. and I've kind of gone different just for going different sake. Yeah, um, I could take take a draw. I'm going to go Lindstrom, purely based on I think he's probably got a little bit more quality going forward. I've seen both of them play this season. I thought, obviously, when Harrison came on against Palace, Palace he did very well, got got the assist. But I also seen you know a, a couple of poor sides of his game. But Lindstrom did very well against Leicester, yeah. and then you saw the poor side of his game against. Um, South it's Crystal Palace, sorry, when yeah. he when he got taken off. So I think there's this is why Dice hasn't picked his best eleven yet because there's still question marks and uh, you know a lot of things to be to be answered. So I think it does leave the right hand side a little bit open defensively. Yeah, I mean but, you, you're offset that a little bit if you got Coleman. No, exactly, which is him, you, so. which is why I've gone with that. But again, at this moment in time, I'm I'm, I'm extremely torn on who should play right. Right wing, and probably it comes down to the opponents as much as anything as well. Yeah. If you're playing against someone that's going to play at the high back line, and it makes absolute perfect sense for Uplands from there, his pace we saw it prove effective in, in a handful of games already this season, haven't we? Just his end product that's missing. I think his end product will come with confidence, yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, so I think part of it is kind of contingent on what the opposition back line is going to do, and then the other part of it is contingent on what you're going to do with right back, isn't it? Um, because I think if you were to go, you, you Lindstrom and Patterson both on the right would would feel a little bit um, vulnerable, and that it'd be excited from an attacking point of view. But yeah. you feel like you worry be a little bit flaky from a defensive point of view. That was the three that played against Leicester, wasn't it? Uh, that was the three that played against Leicester. I mean, that was I was quite excited when I was when I saw that, like how how well they they played and inter, interchanged. To be honest, were you excited by what you saw in the first half against Palace? That was the same three, wasn't it? Then it's wasn't the it? same side apart from Colin. Well, there you go. Then there you go. So that's why it is it is quite difficult to. Um... But then that's but then that again it comes down to you know, how different teams are going to play, isn't it, and things like that. So uh, finish off then, obviously, same as Joe up front, Dominic Carvalho. I don't think there's any question with regards to that. Really, it, there isn't. But it really, is going to be fascinating to see how that Breuer dynamic happens, isn't it? Like if he comes in and he gets fitness, and we see say. Breuer on loan at Southampton form from a couple of years ago rather than Breuer on loan at Fulham like where he struggled last season if we were to see that it'd be really interesting to see how that impacts 
Deitch is thinking, particularly with the backdrop of, you know, will be ever increasing speculation about Calvert Lewin's future, wouldn't it? So could force Calvert Lewin's hand in a wave. Well, this is it. You know, is you know, Bruyne starts well, and you know, that's it. And you know, for all that there may well be some interest in Calvert Lewin, whether or not it's on terms that he views as as as, as worthy, it's, it's another matter. You know, and that's it. So yeah. Okay, well, let us know in the comments if you agree or disagree with mine or Joe's best Everton team on paper. Um, extremely, well, not difficult, but, you know, Dice hasn't been able to do pick his team or what we believe to be his, his best team so far this season because of injuries and suspensions, what have you. But, yeah, let us know in the comments what you think. Uh, Joe, I think we'll uh, we'll finish off there, but any final remarks before before we do? No, we've got the Ipswich pod coming up on, on Friday. Friday. So I'll have been at Finch Farm on Thursday yep, ahead of that. Um, and yeah, looking forward to it coming back. Looking forward to football coming back. But Everton are very, very good at making me regretting feeling that way. I mean, it's, you get to the Tuesday, Wednesday of internet, a lot of international breaks and can't wait for Everton to come back. And then by, you know, half past five on a Saturday, I'm there thinking, oh my God, <laughs> hopefully that won't be the case uh, on, on Saturday. Because I tell you what, it's going to be, a long well with that and Southampton and the fortnight that's two very very long days out that is for um you know to to be coming back with nothing so hopefully it won't be the case make sure Chris has taken his putties yeah well we'll probably set off um after he's had and that'll probably be the the the, the, the time that he'll I get him to sound the alarm when he's finished his his butties and and then we'll go absolutely okay well thanks for sticking with us Friday as Joe mentioned we're going to do the Ipswich preview pod um, we will be live and we're hopefully going to go early roughly around 10am so just keep an eye out for that one on the Royal Blue YouTube channel and as always the audio will be on Apple Podcasts uh, later that afternoon following the, the live show okay that is all for today's show uh, please remember to give us a like and subscribe to the channel as well and give us a 5 star review on Apple and Spotify I've been Ian Kroll, joined by Joe Thomas, and this has been the Royal Blue Podcast. The Royal Blue Podcast from the Liverpool Echo.